Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to Summit Church. We're so glad that you have joined us this weekend. And if you are a guest with us, we especially want you to know how glad we are that you're here. If you have any questions about the church, if there's anything that we can do to serve you, we'd love to make ourselves available to you for that. You can learn, of course, all about the church uh, by exploring our website. Uh, but we would ask, if you're willing to, uh, that you would uh, uh, click the Get Connected link uh, below uh, this message on the sermon page. And that'll just give us an opportunity to know enough about you to hopefully be helpful to you in, in connecting you to, to opportunities in the church and ways to connect, but really uh, in a greater understanding of what it looks like for us to be a community of people trying to follow Jesus. For those of you who are partners or regular attenders here, welcome back. I want to talk a little bit before we move forward into this service uh, about last week. And, uh, and I imagine for many of you, um, you experienced the service uh, the way I did with my family um, in our home. And the contrast between the news that we watched when we woke up in the morning, the heartbreak that is rending our country um, and our city, um, and, uh, and, and the service as we experienced it, the contrast was stark. And of course, when I experienced that, when I experienced the heavy heartedness that I carried into the sermon and then, uh, and then the lightness of the celebration of, uh, of our seniors and the, and the whole service, of course, I had all of these reasons for why that was the case. This seniors had given up so much uh, in, in moments to appreciate uh, their, their, their graduation. I wanted them to have uh, their moment. We'd pre-recorded the service, and so how could we know uh, what our country would be experiencing? All of these reasons um, kept coming to mind for why this should be okay. But the reality is, it was not okay. I felt it in that moment, um, and I've felt it since, and had people kindly uh, tell me that was the case. And here's why it was not okay. Because there are people in our church, people of color, who, who the experience that, that, that they were seeing on the news was not a distant thing, a, a, a report of something happening somewhere else. It was touching their, their lives very clearly and very, very directly. And in not addressing it as clearly and directly as a church, in that moment, we left room uh, for people of color to think that, that the deepest pain that they're experiencing right now in our world doesn't matter to the church. And for that, I apologize. And the other reason I apologize is because there are people who even when you hear me apologize, it makes you feel uncomfortable because it is easy and it is possible to keep the, the problems in this world, at least in regards to racial injustice, at a distance. And the fact that we left room for you to think the church can do one thing and, and, and what is happening in our world is not central to who we are as a church and the purpose of the church, I apologize that I left room for you to think that it might be okay not to care, to hold those things at an arm's distance. My hope is that we will, even, even as we make mistakes along the way, and as we learn to repent and lament and be a part of change, that we will be committed to always moving forward towards seeing greater justice, greater racial equity in our world. It's not just a social issue, it is part of who we are called to be as a church. As we move forward, I'm especially looking forward to the series uh, that we're beginning today. We're gonna be spending the summer in the book of Psalms and, uh, and as we've planned for this series over the course of many months, uh, we, we couldn't have known uh, that our first three speakers for this series, I think are exactly who God wanted us to hear from. We'll be hearing uh, in, in reverse order uh, from, from Sylvester Robinson, uh, who, who's a dear friend and leader in town, David Jacques, who's the, the pastor of the Kingdom Church and, and, and a good friend of Summit. And this week, uh, we get to hear uh, from Arul, who he, along with his wife Betsy and their son Arjun, are partners at our Waterford campus. I actually first met you uh, at a partnership class uh, a few years back. Um, Gary had said, uh, you need to meet Arul. He's, uh, he, he is uh, an impressive person and a great leader and, uh, and is going to do big things. And, uh, and he's right. And it's been an honor uh, to get to know you. Arul is, uh, is a leader with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, which is a ministry uh, that works in colleges and universities um, and, and is intentionally multi-ethnic and diverse ministry. And Arul has been one of those voices, one of those people that I go to uh, for wisdom and counsel and how, uh, and how we as a church embrace the full ethnicity uh, that is the kingdom of God in the community of the church. Arul, uh, we talked a little bit earlier this week and, uh, and I said, you know, I know you're preaching on Psalm 1, but I said, I want you to feel permission um, to speak to this moment in history um, in, what, in whatever way you'd like. So before the pressure of preaching and all of that, uh, I, I would love to hear from you just 
for us, for our Summit family, um, what is it that you would say is the church's role in moments like this in history? And what is it that we as believers uh, can do um, to, be, to, to take right and positive action? I think at this moment in time, um, first, for those of you who are people of color and you're feeling the, the grief and the anxiety or the uncertainty around this moment, it is good and right for you to take space for yourself, for you to care for yourself, um, to allow yourself to be in the moment and to be human and to feel what you feel. I think as a church, uh, there's a couple things that comes to mind when I think of um, addressing this moment, specifically around racial disparities and what God might call us to. I think one thing, uh, one of the things I think of is owning and reflecting on our history. So I think about that both for uh, like personally, like our family history, how were we raised in regards to ethnicity and race? What were we taught? What were things that our family was silent on? What were things that our family talked about? What were the jokes that were discussed at dining table conversations? To reflect and to own that and to look at it, even though there might be things when we think about race and the way our family viewed race that we don't like. To, to own that and to own our ethnic story, um, whether you're a uh, a white person, a black person, you're multiracial, you're an immigrant to this country from another place. There are, those are all parts of uh, who you are and all parts that God cares about. And so it's important to reflect on that and be aware of how you're coming into this moment. But we also own our history collectively as a nation. So my family, uh, you know, we moved here, we immigrated here from India in the 90s. And we came into a story of the history of this country around racism that started with slavery, that had many centuries of that, and there's, you know, that's kind of mutated over time, and it's caused a lot of the racial disparities we see uh, in systems that um, uh, create inequality for black people and other people of color. And we have to know that history, and we have to own that history. Unless, because racism and the things that we're seeing happen on the news right now, it's not happening in a vacuum. It's not like, oh, it's just happening and these people are just choosing to do that. We aren't a historical people. We come into a context. And unless we understand our own personal and family context and story and the context of the story of our country and their views around these things, we won't ever move forward. Um, we won't ever be able to know the truth and bring that to the Lord. And so that would be the next step after reflecting and owning our history, and this happens over time. It might be a lifetime of reflecting on those things. But we, we confess and we repent. We do biblical things that God calls us to when we see prejudice and bias in ourselves that was passed down from family, um, that we didn't even know we had or that we were supporting. We confess that, we repent. Uh, we take it to the Lord in prayer. Um, and we do so uh, knowing that the Lord uh, has us in a process. And it's something that we do over the course of our life. Racism will never be healed in a person, just like jealousy or anger, something we're constantly confessing and repenting of. Um, and so these are things that we confess and repent. Um, and we do so also in corporate uh, ways. We, we confess the, the sins of our church, the sins of our country, the sins of the church in America at large. Um, there are many examples of corporate repentance in the scriptures. And so we enter into those things. I think the last thing I think of in this moment is that we listen and um, we act. Um, so we listen to the voices of people of color. We listen to organizations that are doing racial, uh, 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 racial justice work right now. Um, what are they calling us to do? They've been in this space thinking about this, reflecting on this. How can I join with what they're doing? Um, and then we act. And I think the first place that we sh should think of acting, I think peaceful protesting and demonstrating and raising your voice is important, but we should also think about where are the spaces I'm in all the time? How can you influence there? If you're an educator, how do you think about the ways people of, uh, students of color are treated in your classrooms or at your school or employees? If, you do, if you're in healthcare, how are, what are the systems and the ways that we're providing care affecting uh, different uh, ethnic populations? Um, if you work in, uh, if you're a local leader, if you work uh, in policing, these are places where you ask God, how can I have influence here? How can I act? Um, because 
there are so many leaders in Summit. Whether or not they're a leader in the church, they're a leader in, in where God has called them to be. And so in that place, they can affect change if they listen to the voices of those people who are calling for change and then pray and, and take steps with, with the knowledge that we do it in humility. We might not always get it right, um, but we commit to it um, for the rest of our life because that's uh, God is on the side of seeing justice and renewal and change. Well, thank you. And yeah, and just an encouragement uh, in that, um, you said you may not always get it right, and I can pretty much guarantee uh, that, that that'll be the case. And the courage isn't the courage to get it right all the time, but to continue uh, moving forward even, even as we learn. Uh, we've posted a, a list of, of resources that can help you learn and understand both the, the racial context of our day and the history uh, that feeds it. And I think we can put a link um, up below um, the sermon on the sermon page um, as well. And we encourage you to explore that library of really helpful resources. We're going to continue in the worship service, and Rule actually sent me a prayer this week that came out of Charlottesville, Charlottesville and it was, a, it was a community prayer of acknowledgement of, uh, of the pain of racial injustice and the reality that it is only God uh, who brings healing in that. So we're going to begin our worship service in, in a congregational reading of that prayer. We'll also continue uh, with the singing of songs and hymns to God and the giving of tithe and offering. If you're a guest with us today, the tithe and offering part is not for you. We hope that you receive this service as our gift to you, and we want you to know that we are glad that you're with us today. And for those of us who are partners or regular attenders here, you know why we give. We give out of gratitude, obedience, and trust that God can use our resources for his good and eternal purposes. With that in mind, let's continue to worship and worship our God who loves us very much. Would you join me as we pray this prayer responsively together? I'll read the portions that say leader, and then together we'll read the portions uh, for the congregation. Lord Jesus, your kingdom is good news for a world caught in racial hostility. We ask that you would give us grace for the deep challenges facing our country. Read with me. Oh Lord, only you can make all things new. Lord, we confess our anger, our deep sadness and our collective sense of weakness to see this world healed through our own strength. O oh Lord, only you can make all things new. Lord, we honestly confess that our country has a long history of racial oppression, that racism has been a strategy of evil powers and principalities. O oh Lord, only you can make all things new. Lord, we confess that the gospel is good news for the oppressed and the oppressor. Both are raised up. Both are liberated, but in different ways. The oppressed are raised up from the harsh burden of inferiority. The oppressor from the destructive illusion of superiority. O oh Lord, only you can make all things new. Lord, we confess that the gospel is your power to form a new people, not identified by dominance and superiority, but by unity in the spirit. O oh Lord, only you can make all things new. Lord, we ask that you would help us name our part in this country's story of racial oppression and hostility. Whether we have sinned against others by seeing them as inferior, or whether we have been silent in the face of evil. Forgive us our sin. O oh Lord, only you can make all things new. Lord, we pray for our enemies, for those who have allowed satanic powers to work through them. Grant them deliverance through your mighty power. O oh Lord, only you can make all things new. Lord, we ask that you would form us to be peacemakers. May we be people who speak the truth in love as we work for a reconciled world. O oh Lord, only you can make all things new. Lord, we commit our lives to you, believing that you are working in the world in spite of destructive powers and principalities. Bring healing to those who are hurt, peace to those who are anxious, and love to those who are fearful. We wait for you, 
O Lord, make haste to help us. O Lord, only you can make all things new. Amen. Pray with me. Lord, we come to you uh, bringing all of ourselves in this moment, wherever we are, whatever room that we're in. We bring all of our emotions, whatever we've been feeling this week, whether it's grief or lament or indifference, apathy, uncertainty, anxiety, even joy. Lord, we bring ourselves fully to you right now in this moment. And we ask that you would speak to us through your word. Would your Holy Spirit apply what we hear to our hearts, our minds, 
our words, and our behaviors. Lord, don't let this be a waste of time, but meet us in this moment. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, who bears fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This psalm is talking about two different types of people, the blessed one and the wicked. And I want to draw out three things for us from this psalm. The first thing is blessed. The blessed one is faultless. The blessed one is faultless. In the very first verse, we see that the blessed one doesn't do these three things. They don't walk in step with the wicked. They don't stand in the way that sinners take, and they don't sit in the company of mockers. And you'll notice that there's this sort of um, progression of movement from walking to standing to sitting. And it's this uh, progression from a, an active movement to a, a stationary position. It first starts with this motion of walking in step with the wicked, which this text is getting at the idea of, of listening to the advice or the counsel of those that don't know God or don't follow God, that you're listening to that advice, you're listening to what they do. And then it moves to standing. You come to a stationary position, but you're still upright, and you're standing in the way that sinners take. So now we're moving to behaving in the way of sinners. And then eventually we come to this at rest position where you sit, or you're seated. And in the ancient culture, your seat meant a lot about your identity and you're seated in the company of mockers. And so what the text is describing is this downward spiral of selfishness in our life that ultimately leads to finding our identity apart from God finding our identity apart from God. And that really is the core selfishness problem that we have, that we're trying to define ourselves or redefine ourselves in the context of things that don't have to do with God. But the blessed one does not take that road. The blessed one is faultless. That's the first thing our text tells us. The second thing it says is that the blessed one is preoccupied with God's law. The blessed one is preoccupied with God's law. If you look at verse two, we move from these three things that the blessed one doesn't do to these two activities that the blessed one is engaged with, starting with delighting and then meditating day and night on God's law. And if you break that down to delight, right, is to enjoy, to be satisfied, to, to take comfort in something. Um, they're delighting in the law of the Lord, and then they move on to meditating. And this meditation isn't just thinking about God's law, but actually what the, the original language is communicating is that the person is murmuring to themselves. They're reciting. There's an implication of talking the word of God out loud back to themselves, thinking about it, and then talking it again to others and to themselves. So they're delighting, they're meditating, murmuring on the law of God day and night day and night, continually, continually. And when you put those elements together, it's describing this preoccupation, this obsession, this passion, this fixation on the law of the Lord. So what is the law of the Lord? Understanding what the text is talking about when it says the law of God is really important to understanding what this passage is all about. When the ancient uh, Jewish readers would have read this and seen law of the Lord, they would have been thinking the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. And that isn't full of just instructions and commands, 
but it's also sort of the story of God's activity in giving um, these instructions to them, seeing how they responded to them, coming to their rescue when they failed in responding rightly to the instructions of God. So it's God's redemptive story told, is told in the law of God. But it's also referring to the loving wisdom of God to give us boundaries to define our relationship with him. Now, you might hear that and you might think that's problematic. That sounds, uh, you know, I don't like that. Why does God have to set these rules and regulations to define our relationship? That feels really restrictive. But when you think about any relationship, particularly relationships as they increase in their uh, value and your commitment in them, there are clearer and clearer defined boundary lines and expectations in those relationships. If you have a friend, there's an expectation that that friend will be honest with you, that they won't gossip about you, that they won't mistreat you. And when someone steps outside of those boundary lines for that friendship, you talk about that. Please don't mistreat me. When you think of a parent that's taking care of a child, loving parents set boundary lines for their children to flourish and grow and become all that they were made to be. When you think about people who get married, they make these clear defined vows in their marriage that define the boundary lines for their relationship and the flourishing of their commitment. And when you take it to our relationship with God, God sets out in scripture, in the law of God, the beautiful wisdom that would define our boundaries that we might flourish in relationship with him, in relationship with other people, and in relationship with our world. So the blessed person is preoccupied with the wisdom of God and the beautiful redemptive story of God. And when they are preoccupied with this story, this wisdom, they become like trees that are planted by water that let out their roots and soak up the power and the life and the nutrients of God's spiritual power in us. And they bear fruit and their leaves don't wither. They prosper. Now, you might be hearing this and thinking, that sounds great, Arul. Thank you. I am in total agreement. We should value and listen to the scripture. I am great with that. Check that off the list. What's the next point? But the question I have for us is, are you meditating on the entire law of the Lord or are you selectively listening to it? Are you selectively listening to it? Are you listening to what you like and avoiding the things that might challenge you? Are you listening to the things that suit your lifestyle and avoiding what might uh, push you towards growth and seeing outside of your uh, perspective? Are you selectively meditating on the law of the Lord, especially at this moment in history? Have you been meditating lately on what it says in Genesis 1, uh, verse 22, that God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We are made in the beautiful image of God. Past couple weeks, we've been seeing splashed across our screens the filmed threats and murders of black women and men. And it's been leading to outcry in the streets. It's led to anger and it's led to lament and grief. And these are good responses when image bearers of God have that image violated. Because what it means to be made in the image of God, it means that we have intrinsic dignity and worth and value, not based on anything that we ever do or have failed to do, but simply because God has created us. We bear his image. And so it is worth grieving and lamenting these terrible injustices. And when we hear at a time like this, that black lives matter. In response to these events and in response to the, the, the systemic racial disparities that ultimately lead to these events, 
We're making a very reasonable statement. We're hearing a very reasonable statement that only has meaning because of Genesis 1. They matter. These lives matter because they're made in the image of God. Full stop. Amen. Period. End of discussion. Can you hear the cries of our black brothers and sisters to their God as their image is marred? And can you imagine the compassion and the concern that raises in their father, their heavenly father that looks down and acts in history? He does it because they bear his image. It doesn't mean that he doesn't care for his other children that are experiencing oppression or that we shouldn't either. But at this moment, they're crying out for justice and their lives matter because they're created in the image of God. And it's worth lamenting and being angry about this injustice and grieving and praying and interceding and acting. Black lives will always matter because they are made in the image of God. Are you meditating on God's law or are you selectively listening to it? Let me point out one other scripture that is relevant to this moment in history. James, the brother of Jesus, writes in James chapter 2, he says, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, then you do right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted as lawbreakers. Your neighbor, as Jesus redefined and expanded the definition of neighbor, is not just people who are like you, who are not just people who uh, share the same cultural values as you or has the same socioeconomic background or comes from the same part of the world as you. Your neighbor are people who are very different than you. My neighbor might be someone who I have animosity and has hurt me. I have resentment towards. My enemy is even my neighbor. To love your neighbor is to love, yes, the oppressor, the one who is that we pray as a follower of Jesus, I should pray and ask that conviction would come over those who perpetrate injustice in our world, who perpetrate racial injustice at this time and have throughout history. I should pray and speak out that they would turn to the Lord. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we should pray for the oppressed, whether they are like us or not like us. If we show favoritism, we sin and are convicted as lawbreakers. Could we murmur that scripture to ourselves this week? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Are you meditating on the law of the Lord or are you selectively listening to it? The blessed one is faultless. The blessed one is preoccupied with God's law. And this is the final point from this text. The wicked are judged. The wicked are judged. If you look at verses four through six in this text, there's this pretty stark contrast between the blessed one who is this flourishing, beautiful, fruit-bearing, evergreen tree planted by this constant life source, and then the wicked who are described as chaff, which is the um, waste product when you harvest wheat. It's blown away. We can't eat it as people. It's, a, it's, a, it's something you would throw away. The chaff, the wicked are described as chaff that is blown away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Their way leads to destruction. And I believe that word for us in this moment is a word of hope and power. That's a word of hope in this moment. The wicked will be judged for wrongdoing. So much of the public outcry right now, the protests that are happening, is because of this feeling that the wicked are getting away, that they're not being held accountable, that wicked systems that per per perpetuate injustice based on race, there are people who sustain those systems and they're getting away. And the innocent are dying and no one's looking out for the innocent. Well, Psalm 1 verse 6 says something different. 
The Lord watches over the righteous and the wicked, their way leads to destruction. I think peaceful protest and demonstration that calls for the wicked to be held accountable and wicked racist systems to be changed is good and right and we should call for that. But my greatest hope comes from knowing that at the end of time, when God gathers all of the nations before him, the wicked will be separated and they will be held accountable. And as it says in Hebrews, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The wicked will not go unpunished. They will be held accountable. And what gives me the resources and energy to act in this moment is knowing that will happen at the end of time, is knowing that's where history is moving, that God is on the side of justice and righteousness and the vulnerable and the oppressed, and he will punish the wrongdoer. So I can act now. I can pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven because in heaven you will hold the wicked accountable and the righteous you watch over. The wicked are judged. Let me close and, and tie this together and show us the larger reality that this psalm points to. The tree is a really important image in scripture. Um, there are th actually three important named trees in scripture. And two of them you hear about in, in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, uh, probably very familiar with them, the tree of life that's planted in the middle of the garden. Uh, the, and there's this river that comes up and waters all of the trees, including the tree of life, which its fruit, if eaten, will give us eternal life. And then there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in the imagination of the ancient Jew reading Psalm 1, they would have immediately seen verse 3 where it says this, this tree planted by streams of water that bears fruit, that has leaves that don't wither. Whatever they do prospers and there's water that is flowing beside it. They would have thought of the tree of life. They would have also, reading the psalm about the wicked and the righteous, they would have drawn the connection between the choice that the wicked and the righteous have today and the choice Adam and Eve made, the choice that they had, because they failed to meditate on the law that God had given them on to eat. They could eat of every tree. Here, I'm defining the boundary lines of our relationship, but do not eat of this or you will surely die. But they took and they ate. And because they chose to disavow God's wisdom, it brought death. And because of their choice, systemic evil has pervaded everything. It's pervaded everything. And it's caused us to actually redefine good and evil on our terms. And we end up calling good evil. And we end up calling evil good. We see unarmed black men killed by unnecessary force and we say they are to blame for it. Or we say that racist ideologies and systems don't exist even though the world is run by sinful people. We call evil good and good evil. We've reversed the poles because we've disavowed the wisdom of God. So this psalm takes us back to the beginning and our core selfishness problem, this downward spiral, all of humanity from our first parents till now, we've been caught in it. But it also points us forward. It points us forward. If you notice verses one through three, the blessed one, it's singular. But verses four through six are in the plural when it talks about the wicked. For all have sinned and fall short. But there's only one who's been faultless, who's meditated day and night and delighted in the scripture perfectly. There's only one who is like this tree of life, who gives life. It points forward to the person and the work of God himself coming in human skin, Jesus Christ. 
And it points forward to that third tree, the cursed tree that Jesus was killed on, the tree of the cross, as the New Testament writers say in Acts, the God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God came into the world in Jesus and calls us back to the garden. Out of love, out of love Jesus hung on this cursed tree and took the responsibility for our wickedness and selfishness so that we could be transplanted back to Eden. Did you catch it? He became a desolate tree so that we could become a flourishing, uh, life-giving tree that has this constant eternal supply of life. When he himself was that tree of life, he became the desolate tree so that we could have life eternal. And he transplants us. We have the hope to be planted in that new Eden. Have you meditated? Have you been preoccupied with the scripture, with the end of the Bible, with the last chapter in Revelation where we see this new city, this new Eden? And there it is. The tree of life is there. And the fruit is there. And the, and the, the river of God is flowing in that city. It's the same image from Genesis, the same image from Psalms, and the leaves are there, but now they are the leaves for the healing of the nations, the healing of the nations. We can pray for healing, racial healing in our time now because there's healing for the nations at the end of time, and we need healing. For the problem of injustice, of, of varied groups and racism, and all the isms, we need healing. It's a spiritual problem. And we need the healing from the leaves of the tree of life, this evergreen tree. We can be with God in the heavenly city through Christ, the rede Redeemer. Here's the question for us. What, what are you going to choose? Are you gonna to choose to become preoccupied with the wisdom and the story of God soaking in that life-giving power to love your neighbor, your enemy as yourself? Or will you selectively listen to the scripture? Will you choose to take heart today and not despair that the wicked will be punished and the righteous God will look after them? God is looking out for them. God is on the side of justice. And will you choose even today, maybe for the first time, to put your trust in this Jesus, who is the only one capable of naming that selfish spiral we find ourselves in and transplanting us to that new Eden where we can have life and be free of our sin, of our shame, of our selfishness? What will you choose? Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we need your healing. We need the healing that comes from the tree of life. Would you apply it now in our city? Would you apply it now in our families, in our schools, in every structure and system in our world, God? We ask for that healing and may we not stop asking for it until your kingdom comes. May your kingdom come in the midst of injustice and despair and sadness on earth as it is in heaven. We need you, Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
is mercy in your sight Your statutes are my heritage forever My heart is set on keeping your decrees Please still my anxious urge toward rebellion Let love keep my will upon its knees
Well, Bain, thank you for leading us in worship. And Arul, thank you uh, for leading us uh, this week in this moment in history uh, and in this beginning of the series on Psalms. Arul left us uh, with the question, what will you choose? Will you choose to, uh, to take in the full measure of God's law or be a selective listener? Will you choose to find hope in the reality that God promises that ultimately the wicked will be held accountable and the righteous will find peace? Will you choose to trust Jesus, even when, and maybe especially in the turmoil and disruption and distortion of the world that we live in? I would encourage you as you navigate how you answer that question, and especially as you take in the full measure, meditate on the fullness of God's word, that you engage fully in the book of Psalms, both in the series as we go through it and in, in the reading plan that will be accompanying it. The Psalms invite us into, in, into the fullness of the human experience, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the fullness of mankind's relationship with God. And so as we, take, as, we, as we take in his law, the Psalms help give context, give heart and emotion to what it means to, to, to delight in God's law. I'd also encourage you, if, if, uh, if, if you're trying to figure out what can you do and how can you learn and how can you understand how to navigate this season, this moment in history well, in particular in regards uh, to racial injustice, we've posted a, a reading list that has wonderful resources that are both about understanding uh, racism and about understanding the history and context behind it and, and their age-appropriate resources as well. So I would encourage you to check that out. As we go through this week, let's go through this week with courage and hope and a commitment to action. Now hear these words of benediction as we close our time together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in God's peace. The service is ended.